amen to that. Welcome. It is awesome to see everybody this morning. Welcome to the Journey of Longmont services this morning. We are online with you. We hope you're all ready to worship, ready to hear God's word, and we are excited to see a few faces here with us today. So thank you so much for joining us. Please stand for our call to worship. I'm going to read from Psalm 103. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. Let's sing about our good father on Father's Day today. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never A good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Oh, I've seen many searching for answers. Far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers. Only you provide, cause you know just what we need before we say a word. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways.
God, your amazing love for us. Who can fathom it? God, to be able to be here this morning and worship you because you are the God of love. You are our good, good Father. And Lord, we know on a day like today where we celebrate fathers, there's so many people have so many different experiences. And yet to know that you, God, are the perfect Father. The one we've always wanted, the one we're looking for, and the one who finds us and brings us home. And so this morning we worship you and we praise you and we ask that you draw us closer to you, our good, good Father. We pray this through your son's dear name, Jesus. Amen. Well, everybody go ahead and have a seat. It's good to be with you this morning. For those of you that are here, I uh, just want to be able to say thank you for being here. Uh, first of all, I'm going to recognize that, um, that as introverts, you don't have to meet and greet anybody this morning, okay? So with that, we're just saying uh, for folks that are meeting and greeting, we're just going to ask that you do that outside. We're trying to keep the, uh, the in-building uh, chatter to a minimum. Just that, it's that whole piece. Coronavirus is still very much alive and active in our world today. Um, with that, a couple of things. Uh, we are planning on um, getting back into full worship, uh, in quotes, uh, July 5th. So this coming week, this coming Sunday, we're not going to have anybody in-house. In fact, this coming week, I'm really excited about this, is that uh, next week Sunday, Laura DeGroat, who is the author of the book that we're going through, uh, Live Wide Awake, is actually going to be giving the message on the chapter that I'm really excited that she's going to be doing, which is uh, being a mom. And, uh, and it's a very personal one for her, and I'm just incredibly grateful that she was willing to do this because I couldn't imagine uh, having somebody better be able to give the message on that chapter. With that, uh, we do want to recognize that July 5th, we're hopefully going to be coming back. And with that, though, just like this morning, there's going to be uh, adjustments that we all have to make because for those of you that are here, uh, the way things are set up in the sanctuary, this is not normal, right? And so one of those things we want to remind you that when you come into the building, when you leave the building, when you walk around the building, we ask that you put your masks on. If you're singing, we ask that you put your mask on. Uh, when you're sitting, you can certainly take your mask off, all right? So feel free to do that. Uh, but if you're walking around, uh, we're asking that you put the mask on. And act actually, this is in line with what Colorado Department of Health is requiring of us. Folks, I have been on seven phone calls with the governor uh, listening in, so it doesn't sound like, don't get too pressed in that, right? With a whole bunch of other pastors, okay? But listening in almost every week as they try to figure out how to allow churches to come back together. And here's why they're giving the criteria that they're giving. In fact, it was the first time that I heard it this week um, that I wanted to pass on to you because it was the first time that it actually made sense to me. Maybe I just haven't been hearing it uh, because it's all in the you know, political speak of capacity. All right? But you're like, why only 50? And like even now, it's like we're only doing 25 this morning, up to 25. Part of that is us. Um, because we're trying to figure this out. Interestingly enough, with the configuration of our room, we really do max out at 50. Like, we would not even be allowed to do more than 50. But the reason that they're doing this actually has to do with the fact of the capacity of the Boulder County Department of Health and Colorado Department of Health. One of the things I heard is that for every case of corona, or everybody that's tested positive, they have to do the check of everybody else who's connected around that one person, right? And for every positive case, it takes five hours of man hours to be able to track who that person has been with so that they can get an idea of who that person has been in contact with. So from last week Thursday to this week Wednesday, I don't know if you guys noticed that in the, in the paper, but Boulder County had an increase of 110 cases times five hours. Boulder County Public Health doesn't have that kind of staff, so right now they're pulling in staff 
from all the other counties in the state that don't have any cases. So you can imagine, though, if we start seeing a spike again and every county department has to do their own, we're not able to keep up with the capacity. When they talk about capacity, that's what they're talking about. Capacity to track, capacity to care. Now look, everybody's got a bunch of different opinions about this. However, we, as a church, where we talk all the time about being a positive influence in our community, about where we say pray for the prosperity of our city because if it prospers, we prosper. Where we are all about the people around us. We are going to do everything we can in an overabundance of caution, in a ridiculous amount of caution. And some people would say an absurd amount of caution. That's what we're doing. Because that's what we believe helps enhance our witness as followers of Jesus as opposed to detracting from it. Now, you might be saying, wow, Rick, you're sounding pretty stern on this one. Yes, I am. And when it comes to the lead team and it comes to me, this is the path that we have taken and we have chosen because this is what we believe is the right response to what we're going through as a community and as a nation and as a world at this time. This is what we'll continue to do. So with that, if those regulations and restrictions don't work for you, that's fine. Um, you know, we, wanna, we are going to continue to do live streaming. This is not something that's going away. Uh, we're going to continue to do this for as long as we can and into the future. Um, however, we want to make sure that we're being responsible citizens and responsible uh, in the, the outpouring of the gospel. Bill. I am not going to talk about the people on the pill who are partying and being selfish because those are the folks that I'm going to talk about us and our responsibility. Um, I, I appreciate that, Bill. Uh, one of the lines somebody was saying that those things that makes us feel like second class citizens. Um, All I can answer is we're seeking to be as responsible as we can be and, uh, and therefore uh, if somebody chooses not to do that within the context of this, then we, how do I say this? Uh, what's that? We sacrifice in love. Yep. Thanks, Barb. So I know it's frustrating and yet this is where we are and this is where we go to move forward be able to continue to do this. So, um, all right, I hate doing all that stuff because it's like we have this really great worship time and then we're like, let me just pour some hot, cold water on that. All right. With that though, thank you all for being here and appreciate you guys being able to give any feedback of the last week and this week uh, with our configuration and what we have. Uh, th this is the... Um, Moving forward, we got to figure this stuff out. So we appreciate you being here for that. Hey, a couple of other things. Enough about that. Uh, a couple other things. We uh, this week we are giving 10% of our offerings, our gifts, and our offerings uh, it goes to Habitat for Humanity. So for those of you that are here, you are more than welcome to be able to give your gifts and our offerings in the boxes in the back. Which reminds me that we need to tape those lids open, so so you don't have to touch stuff. We're trying to make it a touchless experience when you walk in. So, uh, but 10% is given this week to Habitat for Humanity, the Apostles Bill. That's where we are participate with a number of other churches to be able to help build uh, uh, Apostles Bill, uh, a house for Habitat. Um, one of the things, a reminder around that, that if you want to be able to give online, you can give via our website. If you go to a website, click on the giving tab. There's also a place where you can note um, where you can go and text to give, as well as uh, be able to just use your bank to do bill pay or you mail it in to the Journey 2000 Pike Road, Unit A, Longmont, Colorado, 80501. And uh, thank you again 
for all of you that are uh, c- that continue to support this ministry. This week we're having lead team, and with lead team we're actually finalizing our ministry spending plan. Uh, we're doing that a little late this year, but we think we've everything is up in the air, and we're trying to adjust for this. And so we will have that information out to you this week, and then be able to uh, figure out how to be able to get everybody's approval on that, and be able to to show that we'll get that information out this week as well. Um, This week we're praying for, uh, we pray for local churches and churches that are part of our region as Christian Reformed churches. So this week we are praying for Longmont Ambassador Baptist Church, which is down on uh, 3rd Avenue between Sunset and Hover. So we're praying for those folks this morning, as well as Jesus on Colfax Ministries, which is uh, a ministry to uh, the SRO hotels that are all on the very far east side of Colfax in, uh, in East Denver and Aurora. So praying for that ministry and for uh, Sean Sikama and his wife and the work that they're doing there. A couple of the prayer uh, updates. Doug and Melissa Vinskoy's daughter Josie is getting married next week Sunday on the 28th. So we're excited about that. And uh, so lots of people that are coming in for that. So for uh, travel protection as well as protection from illness for the event, for all the participants that are in there. Fortunately, it is an outdoor wedding. And so uh, we praise God for that. But it's wonderful to be able to see Will and Josie start their life together. Uh, and then also just to thanks, Linda Curatolo is working uh, at a different position in the hotel that she's been working for. Uh, she had been furloughed and now is uh, got a different job. So praying that she'll be able to be a valuable member of the team uh, and that things will go well in the position. So, And then uh, we, we c- pray for Peter Raymer's mom often, and we're glad to be able to do that. Um, and this is, she's coming up with her first physiotherapy session to remedy some permanent uh, arm pain that she's been having. And so we'll be praying for that this week as well. By the way, as we, we get, I want to... Clear, clarify one thing as well here as we, you know, tried to social distance uh, and have masks on and everything else. And you're like, well, how come you don't have a mask on? And how come the people up here don't have a mask on? And that's a great question. Um, so one of the things, one of the requirements is obviously six feet spacing between people except for the people that you came with. But between uh, those who are up here singing and anybody there is a minimum of 25 feet. And so that's what we have. So from me to you, Barb, is about 24 feet. So, but I tried to put it back. No, actually, I was up there at 24, so I'm at good. I'm 25. I did move. I forgot if I moved this or not. So that's why we don't have masks here, but that's why we have the front row chairs there. So it's like that's kind of the barrier between the mask zone and the no mask zone. So just in case you were wondering. All right. Wow. That took entirely too long. So let's get back into worshiping God. And let's, as we get ready to uh, get into his word, let's take the rest of the service to God in prayer. God, thank you so much that we get to be here this morning and that we get to be able to be meeting uh, in, our, in our own homes and uh, wherever we might be. That you give us this wonderful opportunity uh, through technology to be able to gather together despite the fact that we're apart. And yet to be able to be here today with you and to know that your spirit is with us wherever we are. That's the beauty of being your body. And so this morning, God, as we open up your word to be able to hear what it is that you want us to hear, uh, open up our hearts and our minds, open up our ears to hear well, and draw us, draw us to you, Lord us to you. We lift this to you in your name. Amen. I keep being struck by the timeliness of Laura's book. As I've been going through these chapters, you know, we kind of picked it. It's one of those things I wanted to be able to do, and then we just said, ah, let's just do it. And yet the timeliness of these chapters to what's going on in our world around us, uh, is just it's been stark for me. And this was one of those weeks uh, on a variety of levels 
that I was reminded about how much is wrong with our world and how very little I can do about it. And yet this week, in Laura's book, in her Pay Attention Practices, she had us look at Isaiah 40, a whole week of looking at Isaiah 40. And it really helped me be able to put things back into perspective again. And so this morning, I'd like to be able to walk through a bit of Isaiah 40 with you. So we're going to read Isaiah 40. Um, If you've got your Bibles, uh, open that up. If you've got a Bible app, I'm going to be reading out of... uh, Isaiah chapter 40 and reading out of the New Living Translation. Isaiah 40. Comfort. Comfort my people, says the Lord. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Tell her that her sad days are gone and her sins are pardoned. Yes, the Lord has punished her twice over for all her sins. Listen. It's the voice of someone shouting. Clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make a straight highway through the wasteland of our God, for our God. Fill the valleys, level the mountains and hills, straighten the curves and smooth out the rough places. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together. The Lord has spoken. A voice said, shout. I asked, what should I shout? Shout that people are like the grass. Their beauty fades as quickly as the flowers in the field. The grass withers, the the flowers fade beneath the breath of the Lord. And so it is with people. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord stands forever. O Zion, messenger of good news, shout from the mountaintops. Shout it louder, O Jerusalem. Shout, don't be afraid. Tell the towns of Judah, your God is coming. Yes, the sovereign Lord is coming in power. He'll rule with a powerful arm. See, he brings his reward with him as he comes. He'll feed his flock like a shepherd. He'll carry lambs in his arms, holding them close to his heart. He'll gently lead mother sheep with their young. Who else has held the ocean in his hands? Who's measured off the heavens with his fingers? Who else knows the weight of the earth, weighed the mountains and the hills on a scale? Who's able to advise the Spirit of the Lord? Who knows enough to give him advice or teach him? Has the Lord ever needed anyone's advice? Does he need instruction about what's good? Did someone teach him what's right or show him the path of justice? No. No. No, for all the nations of the world are like a drop in the bucket. They're nothing more than dust on the scales. He picks up the whole earth as though it were a grain of sand. All the wood in Lebanon's forests and all the Lebanon's animals would not be enough for burnt offerings worthy of our God. The nations of the world are worth nothing to him. In his eyes, they count for less than nothing, mere emptiness and froth. To whom can you compare God? What image can you find to resemble him? Can he be compared to an idol formed in a mold, overlaid with gold and decorated with silver chains? Or if people are too poor for that, at least they might choose wood that won't decay and a skilled craftsman to carve the image so that it won't fall over. Haven't you heard? Don't you understand? Are you deaf? to the words of God, the words he gave before the world began? Are you so ignorant? God sits above the circle of the earth. The people below him are like grasshoppers. He spreads out the heavens like curtains and makes his tent from them. He judges the great people of the world and brings them to nothing. They they hardly get started, barely taking root. Then he blows on them and they wither. The wind carries them off like chaff. To whom will you compare me? Who's my equal? Asks the Holy One. Look up into the heavens. Who created all the stars? He brings them out like an army, one after another, calling each by its name. Because of his great power and incomparable strength, not a single one is missing. Oh, Jacob, can you say the Lord does not see your troubles? Oh, Israel, can you say that God ignores your rights? 
Have you never heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become tired and weak, and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They'll soar high on wings like eagles. They'll run and not grow weary. They'll walk and not faint. You know, as that passage opens up in those first verses, listen, it's a voice of someone calling and shouting, clear the way in the, through the wilderness for the Lord. Make a straight highway through the wasteland of our God. That section is quoted in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, referring to John the Baptist as he gets ready to announce the way of Jesus. And yet this passage, this chapter, immediately comes after a conversation that Isaiah has with King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah was the last godly king over Judah. His dad, King Ahaz, was horrible. He was just a really really bad king, led the people away from, is, from God, uh, rose up, created all sorts of idols, had people worship the Asherah and, and Moloch. And in fact, uh, Ahaz even sacrificed one of his sons on a, to, to the flames of Moloch. And if you guys know anything about old idols, Moloch was a god that had his arms like this and you had burning fires underneath it and then you set the child on the burning arms of Moloch and that's how you sacrificed your child to this God. And that's what Ahaz did. Sacrificed his own kid to this God. And then he dies and Hezekiah comes along. And Hezekiah turns everything around. Hezekiah cleans out the land, knocks over all the idols, goes back in. The, the temple was in disrepair, repaired it. In fact, the temple had basically become a, a, a warehouse, rooms just full of collected stuff. In fact, it collected old idols. Like they had to clear out the temple of God from idols that were just stored there. Because right? that's what you do with gods. You store them in a temple, I guess. And then Hezekiah got sick. And so he prayed to God. He wept to God like a child, it says in First Second Kings. And God answered his prayer and sent Isaiah to tell Hezekiah that God was going to give him another 15 years. And he healed him. And all the battles that Hezekiah fought, he won them all. Including one where God sent an angel to kill 85,000 of his enemy's troops in the middle of the night because Hezekiah trusted God. And then one day he got some emissaries from Babylon. And they came because they had heard that his God had healed him. And then he showed him everything. In fact, this is how it goes in verse 30, chapter 39. Then Isaiah the prophet went to Hezekiah and asked him, What did those men want? Where were they from? Hezekiah replied, They came from a distant land of Babylon. What did they say in your palace? Asked Isaiah. They saw everything. Hezekiah replied, I showed them everything I own, all my royal treasuries in a moment of pride. Hezekiah basically showed his enemy what they would get if they came. Which is exactly how Isaiah responds and says, I uh, got some bad news for you. This is me paraphrasing, by the way. <laughs> got some bad news for you. This is not going to end well. They were basically on a scouting trip, and while God will bless you and see you through to the end of your reign, the land is going to be emptied once you're gone, and Babylon is going to take all of this away, including your own sons. And Isaiah prophesied the Babylonian captivity. And immediately following that, we step into Isaiah 40. Because that's not good news, is it? To know that at the end of your reign, the rest of your people are going to be, and all of the treasures of your land are going to be taken away. And God is letting Babylon, as you guys may well know, God is letting Babylon come into Judah because Judah had turned their backs on God. They had called out to God and he forgave them, but yet time after time after time, 
over the long term of the covenant, of his covenant relationship with his people, they just continued to turn their back on him. And as soon as Hezekiah was gone, his next son made Ahaz, Hezekiah's dad, look like a cheap imitation. He just went all in, chasing after all the foreign gods. And God allowed Babylon to come in. It was a disciplinary move. And in essence, what Isaiah was saying to Hezekiah and to the people of Israel at the time, bad times are coming. What are you going to do? Who are you going to trust? And it just struck me this week that it was like the same thing is happening today. Bad times are coming. We know they are. In fact, bad times are here. In fact, here's a news cycle release for you if you need it. Bad times are always coming. We might have a good time for a season, and then a bad time will come. I can now say I've been old, I'm old enough to have seen a few of those. I've seen the pattern. I've seen, that, not the cycle, but I've seen the trajectory. Good times, bad times. Good times, bad times. In her book, Laura shared a story about how she and J.R. moved from Colorado to Florida so her husband J.R. could take a job. If you read the chapter, this is going to be a repeat story. If you haven't read the chapter yet, spoiler alert. But it's a great story. So J.R., so Laura and J.R. lived in Niwot for a bunch of years. That's how we became friends for a variety of ways, but that's how our friendship continued. And then J.R. took this job with his company to Florida, and he had a very specific task to accomplish. And after six months, he completed that task, and kudos were written, and thanks were expressed, and pats on the back were given, right? No. Wrong. Since the job was done, he was no longer needed at that level. So, instead of kudos and pats on the backs and letters of commendation written, he got demoted, his salary was reduced, and the large plant in his office was swapped out with a smaller one. Because if you don't have that title, you don't need that big of a plant. Apparently, you need less oxygen. Needless to say, J.R. was mad. He was betrayed, hurt. And he came home that night, and he slapped the paper down on the counter, and he said, it is time to push the eject button. We are out of here. A hard time had made a turn to a worse time, and it was time to go. So that night they ate dinner, and after dinner, like, is the, was, was their routine? So they hauled out scripture to do their devotions, and they had been reading through Isaiah out of the message translation out of a Bible that also had a commentary by Eugene Peterson, the author of the message translation. And as they read that passage, they read Isaiah 40, Eugene Peters, Peterson's commentary jumped off the page at them. Because this is what it said. When you read Isaiah 40, it's saying, don't build castles in the air. Don't construct an elaborate fantasy life about God's future for you. I'm just going to stop right there. That was even a good line for me to read. Because how many times do I think to myself, oh no, God's going to do that. I know. I, this is going to happen and this is going to happen. And I have my preferred future. How many times have we talked about having a preferred future? And therefore, if it's my preferred future for me, it must be God's preferred future for me. And then we have to take a moment to ask ourselves, what is God's preferred future for us? So don't build castles in the air. Don't construct an elaborate fantasy life about God's future for you. In the desert, prepare the way of the Lord. Right here, where the going is roughest. Right here in a foreign place. Here in exile. In this passage, the geographical present is emphasized. You're in a desert. This is very dry, colorless, arid existence that seems to characterize the life of the sufferer. Here is where the highway of God 
is to be built. Don't look for some ejection button to push for an immediate escape. Instead, build a highway which takes time. Build it well and build it where you are. Can you imagine how J.R. and Laura must have felt in that moment? An hour earlier, it is time to hit the eject button. An hour later, you're reading your devotions, and the commentator writes, don't look for some ejection button to push to immediately escape your situation. Did God really have Eugene Peterson write those words for this moment, right down to the eject button reference? Does God do that? Yes. Yes, he does. This is the kind of God we have. This is what God does. And in doing so, through Isaiah 40 and little moments like this, that God reminds us of two things, that God is not so distant that he does not know what you're going through, and God is much bigger than you think he is. Because there are times when we take a look at those two statements and we think they're opposites. God is big. And he's out there somewhere, and he is way too busy. He's got too many other things on his mind to care about my little thing, what's going on here. Or if God cares about my little thing here, he's imminent. God knows what's going on here, and he can actually know what's going on in my life. Is he really big enough to be able to do something about it? And yet here it is. God, taking the words of Eugene Peterson and knowing how many years later that what Eugene Peterson writes and what J.R. says are going to align in that exact moment when they needed to hear that God knew their situation and what was going on. And what do you do in those moments? You don't hit the eject button. In those moments, you build a highway in the middle of the desert that you're in. And it means that when times get tough, don't reject God. When times get tough, don't ignore God. When times get tough, don't think, don't imagine for a minute that he's not there. Because that happens, doesn't it? We're going through really difficult times. And we're like, where's God? Where is God? He seems silent. He seems distant. We call out and we pray and it bounces off the ceiling and it comes back down. That's what it feels like. And in those moments, we're kind of like, fine, God, if that's what you're going to do, if you're going to ignore me, I'm going to ignore you. Most of us, if not all of us, have been there. And what Isaiah is saying, look, when you're in this desert moment, when you're in this desert moment, do everything you can to remove the barriers in life so so that when God shows up, you won't miss it. Knock down the mountains. Raise up the valleys. Clear the way. Make the highway straight. Straighten the curves. Smooth out the rough rough places. Then God's bright glory will shine and everyone will see it. What's amazing to me in Scripture is how this happens. Like we can read this passage and we can apply it to our scenario and yet Several hundred years later, this is exactly what John is saying for the coming of Jesus. Look, you look at your life and you look all around and everything is messed up. It looks like Rome has a corner on the world and you are messed in it and subjugated to them and you are in a desert. Ah, but you've solved it by making your own little world and making your own little niche about what you can do and and you're working to keep temple life together and all of these different things that you're trying to do to manage what's going on in this desert scenario. But in doing so, what they've done, in doing so, what they did is they kept the valleys in place and they kept the hills in place and they kept the curved roads in place as opposed to creating a straight path. And because of it, they missed Jesus. And that's what we can do too if we're not careful. When we're in these desert places, it's so easy for us. I know it's easy for me 
to kind of like hunker down and the way I've been doing it. My first reaction when I'm going through those difficult times is not to create a straight road and a highway in the middle of the desert to see God. Actually, my first tendency tends to be to complain. And yet what Isaiah is saying here, what God is saying here, is look, whatever you're going through, when you feel like God is not there and you're stuck in the middle of this desert, the last thing you should do is hunker down. The first thing you should do is build a highway. Level everything out. Take everything out of your life that gets in the way of you being able to see God. Remove all the barriers in your life so that when God shows up, you won't miss him. That's what Isaiah is saying when he's talking about the bright glory of the Lord, that it'll shine. He's saying that when God shows up and when we see him, God will be more than enough. That's what J.R. and Laura figured out in this time. They ended up staying put. They were there for another couple of years. And during that difficult time, because these words popped off the page from Eugene Peterson, it caused them to open their eyes and be aware so that they could see God time and again in the next couple of years and learn that He is enough. To be reminded that He is enough. To see that He is enough is enough. I had a conversation with a friend of mine a few weeks ago who asked me why God needed us to praise him. We were going through a study and that had popped up in one of the passages about the praise of God's glory. And, uh, and, and it's amazing to me how many times I actually have this conversation with people. Why does God need our praise? You know, is it, does God have self-esteem issues that he needs us to bolster his ego? You know, or is God like the gods, the Greek gods in the Clash of the Titans where they need the prayers of their people, otherwise their power diminishes? Like what is, what, what's with God needing our praise? And, and I've learned this, that I, I think it's a fair question to ask of somebody who doesn't know God. And my first Part of my response, which is typical in this, is like, you know, it's in the same way that we praise people who we deem worthy, like Mother Teresa, Martin Luther King Jr., or Martin Luther King Jr.'s namesake, Martin Luther. Look, all people who all had issues, all issues of their own, and yet they did remarkable things that warrant at least our respect, if not our praise. So what has God done? Tell the cities of Judah, look, your God. Look at him. God, the master, comes in power, ready to go into action. He's going to pay back his enemies and reward those who have loved him. Like a shepherd, he will care for his flock, gathering the lambs in his arms, hugging them as he carries them, leading the nursing ewes to good pasture. When you look around and you wonder how you're going to make it through these tough times and you look at your life and you wonder if God knows or even cares what you're going through, hear these words. This is the picture that Isaiah gives us of God. He's like a shepherd who takes care of his flock, gathering his lambs in his arms, hugging them as he carries them, leading even the nursing ewes to good pastures. This is a a good God, not a God that is distant, not a God that is out, not some deistic you know, movable force that's out there, a personal God that actually cares about you. He's not some distant God that doesn't know what you're going through. He loves you and cares for you so much that he as an author write words you will speak months if not years before you speak them so that you know that God is listening. Is it time to push the eject button? No. Don't push the ejection button. 
And now what do you do? Make a highway in this desert of yours so that you'll see God. As many of you know, I encountered God on a tractor 30 years ago. If you don't know that story and you want to hear it, I'll be glad to tell it. We're not bore everybody else with it. But at the time, I was working on my brother-in-law's gladiola farm. If you guys don't know what gladiolas are, they are flowers. They are tall flowers, seven to eight florets. And my brother-in-law and his dad grew uh, 350 to 400 acres of them. Grew them for the bulbs. And I was working for my brother-in-law on the farm because I had quit seminary. I thought I was going to be a pastor, but I quit, and I was never going to be a pastor. I was never going to go back. And I was out in the field at the time, but we had just finished pulling a toilet in the shop, and we joked that farmers were, must be some acronym for, you know, jack-of-all-trades, master of none, including plumbers. Now, this is all important for what's coming up, because as I'm on my tractor in the middle of this flower field, I'm yelling at God because the radio preacher that I'm listening to was talking about being a child of God, and that was the greatest thing in the world. And by the way, the reason I was listening to a radio preacher is because on the tractor you can only get Christian talk radio or country, and I had had my fill of country that morning, so I had to shift it to Christian talk radio. And the preacher was on, and he's talking, and it's Chuck Swindoll in his series on Grace Awakening, and and he's talking about how it's amazing to be a child of God, and I'm yelling at God, and I'm telling him that's fine being a child of God, but it doesn't make any sense to me. I know what it means, but I don't know what it means, because it makes no difference in my life. And then Chuck Swindoll says this, God doesn't care what you do. God doesn't care if you're a farmer or a florist, a plumber or a preacher. God only cares that you're his child. And I went, you got to be kidding me. Did he really say that? And I actually listened later that night. It came on in the morning and later in the evening, and I listened to it again. And sure enough, he actually said it. You can go back in time, 1990, spring of 1990, and listen to Chuck Swindoll say it doesn't matter if you're a farmer or a florist, a plumber or a preacher. Who does that? Who has an author right? Don't hit the eject button. Months or years before you pull that line out. Who? Who does this when you're yelling at God about being his child and he brings up right in front of you what you're doing? Everything about you. Who can do that? And this is that reminder, right? That God is much bigger than you think he is. Because this is the kind of, and I'll say this playfully, this is the kind of game that God plays with us at times. It's playful. Oh, I can work with that. I can do that. Oh, I know what you need right now. Let me just, let me just plop that down there for you. And let, and let that mess with your mind for a little bit. And hopefully draw out your heart. And in the process, be part of the opportunity for you to pull down the mountains and straighten out the paths that get in the way of you seeing me. To whom can you compare God, Isaiah says. I love how Isaiah moves into this incredible description of who God is, who he really is. I mean, because really, who compares to this God? What Isaiah says in in verses 19 and 20 is, he's like, look, you make idols made of gold or silver or wood, and you have them attached to the wall to make sure that, or they make sure they have a good solid base to make sure they don't tip over. And you go, what, you think those idols compare to God? And yet we keep doing this. Even as people, we keep trying to make gods that compete or compare to God. We still do this today. We have lots of people who are trying to make gods believe that their little puny gods are as powerful as God. And the number one god that we have in our world right now, right, is money, the economy. And we hear it all the time. And here's the crazy thing. Our god, 
this God that we live in in our country is made up of papers and ones and zeros. Paper that burns and ones and zeros that can be deleted by a child making a mistake or a power outage. I remember in the Great Recession of 2008, people were talking about it. Maybe you remember this. People were talking about the invisible hand of the economy. You guys remember that? 12 years ago. And they still talk about it today like that. The invisible hand of the economy, as if they're talking about a person or a god. Now, we would never use that crude language to talk about the economy as a god. We're far too sophisticated for that. And yet, in the gods of old, we had to make sure that we, we chiseled them outright so that they wouldn't tip over, or we made sure that when you put them in the, in the temple that you fastened them to the wall to make sure that they wouldn't fall. And yet, what is the language that we are listening to today about our economy? What can we do to bolster our economy? What can we do to secure our economy? What can we do to make sure that our economy doesn't fall? We talk about our economy like a god. Like, it's a, like it is some physical thing that we have to attach to the wall to make sure it doesn't tip over. And we are willing to sacrifice people to this God. You've heard it if you've been listening to the news. I did a web search last night for this, and I just I, I found over 15 remarks to this end, where rather than damage the economy further, we must accept a certain number of coronavirus casualties so that the rest of us can get back to a thriving economy. Folks, make no mistake, that is sacrificing people on the altar of money. That is no different than putting a child on the arms of Moloch and burning it alive. And you go, oh, Rick, that's pushing it. No, I'm not. Because this is a competing God. When we put our trust in the economy, when we put our trust in money, when we put our trust in the things of this world, it is a competing God, and Scripture calls that idolatry. Anything that does not have us put our trust in God is an idol. There is only one God that can save us because there is only one God who is not asking us to die for him. Instead, he was willing to die for us. Let that sink in. There is only one God who can save us because there is only one God who is not asking us to die for him. Instead, he was willing to die for us. Who else is like him? As Isaiah says, who else can hold oceans in his hands or measures the sky with his fingers. Who else knows the weight of the world to the ounce and the weight of the mountains to the gram? Who knows how much long peak weighs? Who can give God advice or give him pointers on justice? Who in the world is so tough that God couldn't just blow them over with his breath and snuff them out like birthday candles? Oh, and who put the stars in the sky? And knows them all by name. All 100 billion plus of them. And this is the God who knows you well enough to tell you not to hit the eject button. This is the God who comforts his people through these words. Oh, Jacob, how can you say the Lord doesn't know your, doesn't see your troubles? Oh, Israel, how can you say God ignores your rights? Have you never heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. 
Even youths will become weak and tired, and men will fall in exhaustion, but those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They'll soar high on wings like eagles. They'll run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. The God who does not ask you to die for him, but who died for us instead, is the God who created the world and cares so much about you that he is there to carry you through to carry you through whatever you're going through. The question is, do you have the sight lines to see it? And in the middle of whatever you're going through, don't reject God, don't ignore God, don't think He's not there. Make a highway. Make the crooked things straight. Clear the sight lines. Level the mountains and lift up the valleys so you get a clear picture of who God is. Don't hit the eject button. Make a highway and get rid of the things in your life that get in the way of you seeing God and He will reveal Himself to you. He will. And when he does, you'll see that he's enough. Friends, let's take this opportunity and just spend a few moments in prayer with God. And in the prayer, just be able to ask this question. God, what are the things that are in the way in my life? What are the worries? What are the concerns? What are the things that make me angry? What are the things that make me sad? What are the, what are the valleys or the hills or the crooked roads that keep me from seeing you? And then, Lord, help me remove those so I get a clear sight line of who you are. Should we pray that together? Lord, to know that you want to bring us comfort. Comfort in the midst of the difficult parts of life that we're going through. The amazing thing, Lord, is that you know exactly what's going on for each and every one of us sitting here and in our homes. You're not blind to it, or you don't have the inability to see it. You know exactly what it is, and you have done everything you can to draw us to you. And so we pray, Lord, that you will help us see you clearly. And even now this morning, Lord, in these next moments, will you help us see the things that are in our lives that keep us from seeing you and draw us to the clear picture of who you are and what you've done for us. That you've secured for us through your coming, your death and resurrection, and your life in us. Lord, hear our prayers.
Dear God, we thank you for who you are, our limited understanding of what you are, words like awesome, powerful, great, omniscient, omnipresent, everything about you, Lord, is so beyond our ability to comprehend, and yet you love us, and you care about us, you watch over us, you're with us each and every day, and today, Lord, we just want to say thank you, we want to praise you, we want to worship you with everything we are and everything that we have. Lord, we raise up the name of your Son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Please stand for our closing song. you've done.
done for me amazing grace, truly, that you love us so much that you know everything about us, that you're like a good shepherd that carries us up in your arms, that you are the God of creation and that you know enough to care for the details of our lives, just blows our minds and boggles us, and our only response to that is to praise you and glorify you because you are an amazing God. God, we want to create a highway in the desert, not just for us, but for others. And so as we leave this place today, God, we pray that these things that you're working on in our lives, that you'll draw us back to you, that you'll help us create this straight path so that we can see you more clearly, be drawn to you, and know you. God, let this be uh, the foundation that shapes every aspect of our lives, and we worship you and praise you because of it. We thank you. All this in your name, Lord. Amen. Well, my friends, it was good to be able to be together with you today and with you as well. To be back together next week online and be able to hear what it is that Laura has to say to us, what God wants to say to us through Laura. And then to be able to gather together again on July 5th, we'll have all that information coming out in jottings and, and uh, other means that we will send out to you and let you know what's going on. With all of that, my friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Amen. Have a great rest of your week, everybody.